Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us. Hopefully, again, we've got a lot of information to go over. Dr. Box, will you'll share our latest updates, uh, numerically speaking, and our not just the number of cases, but the positivity rate. It continues to thankfully tick down, clocking in at what 4.7 today. Um, and I'm always reminded of January 11th when it was 16.5. I think it was. Um, so moving in the right direction, but a lot more on that in a few minutes. Dr. Weaver is also um, with us, and she's going to have a full report as well, but also touch on some very interesting um, data points, um, including we talk about spillage or waste in terms of vaccine doses. She's got some uh, real numbers behind uh, that actual amount. Uh, as we've been tracking, Dr. Sullivan is also... Um, with us today, and she's going to give us kind of a sneak peek behind the scenes, um, so to speak, about all the work that all the state employees um, and all of our partners all throughout the whole state of Indiana have been uh, really working around the clock to remove every single barrier uh, to people actually getting vaccinated, getting the shots um, in the arms. Also, um, Jacob Sipe, the executive director under the Lieutenant Governor Crouch's uh, portfolio. He's the, Jacob is the executive director of the uh, of our housing agency, and he's going to give us a overview and a update. He'll be back in a couple weeks as well uh, to give us a follow-up uh, on the housing assistance program. Um, we've been working with our state partners. We've got the statewide program and then six separate counties. And Jacob, if you'll um, speak to that, uh, the difference between the two, and then give us an update. Um, we would appreciate that. But before we um, get there, I also wanted to myself give an update on the, we mentioned last week and, and um, alluded to this a couple of weeks ago that we would be getting more um, uh, PPE out to schools and critical businesses throughout the state of Indiana. We've been doing that. We've to date since we reported on that, we've shipped about 140,000 uh, masks to 160 schools. And we had President's Day and we had a couple snow days um, that, uh, that uh, were a couple hurdles, but we're, we're catching up um, on that, um, on those delays. But that's, that's in addition to the other two rounds that we've already, you, you'll recall, uh, February 3rd, um, we, we said we've got a portal set up for our critical businesses. We've um, helped about 190 businesses with this latest uh, round and, and shipment of thousands of masks going out. So we want to make sure that we continue to lean forward into this space and make sure folks have what they need um, and that they're not just responding, but they're prepared as we continue to, even with a 4.7, that still says there's a four point, there's, there's, the transmission rate is out there. And uh, we want to make sure that we're prepared to do everything that we can to continue to slow this. And, and again, more from you um, on that in just a second. Uh, I also want to take a moment just to say thank you. Obviously, um, as we've been rolling this out and with the snowstorm that was inching its way across, I guess across, and the inches were accumulating going up across the whole state of Indiana. Um, you know, our whole network um, instantly um, went into the posture of rescheduling and making, um, you know, taking an appointment for Monday and rescheduling to the tune of about 40,000 of these over a 48 hour, you know, seemingly period. Um, and we just truly uh, appreciate not just Dr. Weaver, but the whole team um, that were able to um, uh, pivot and make sure that we were getting people those shots in the arms um, and, and lessening the anxiety of, oh, no, now what? Mother Nature has intervened yet again. Now what do we do? Well, we're answering that question and getting people um, scheduled. Uh, I also wanted to just very quickly um, just give you a an update on a uh, conference call that I had yesterday with the NGA, the National Governors Association, and the White House. They did inform us that we were going to get an increase in our doses um, 
a small increase going forward, Dr. Weaver can uh, and account for that. Um, all governors, um, uh, both sides of the aisle, um, we're, we're all in the position of here are our top three priorities from our federal partners. We need number one, more doses, number two, more doses, number three, more doses. So we appreciate the more doses. Um, they have also um, explained to us that they're going to include going forward um, FQHCs and some um, long community health clinics in, in their um, program separate of our network and again governors across the country both sides of the aisle this is not a partisan issue uh, we have some concerns and we're working um, with our federal partners on just that because we want to be able to obviously with the community spread we want to know where the doses are going um, we're able to track with our system we talk a lot about 211. We talk a lot about Zotec and, and the folks having one system and then being able to track where the need is and, um, and having the supply try to meet that need. Um, so we're never going to turn away more doses. We love that. Um, but we also want to um, be able to answer questions from citizens um, or the press or anyone that asks about who um, – is is getting doses in the state of indiana and and we have prided ourselves and there's been some turbulence along the way we're building this aircraft in flight truly and there's going to be some bumps along the way but but one thing that we've been able to maintain is the integrity of the overall system mm -hmm. and um, that's critically important to to every state and territory out there and so we'll continue to um, work with our federal partners to try to make sure that we're all on the same page, kind of one sheet of music to sing from. Um, and with that, I will now turn it over to Dr. Box. All right. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, Hoosiers. More than 834,000 Hoosiers have received their first dose of vaccine as of today. That's an increase of more than 97,000 from last week. Of those individuals, more than 356,000 have received both doses and are fully vaccinated. It's incredibly exciting to see these numbers continue to climb. When we look at our appointments, more than 1.6 million appointments have been scheduled since we first began offering vaccine in December. Dr. Weaver will walk you through these numbers and next steps shortly. The vaccine is a vital tool to our recovery from this pandemic, but it's just one tool. We must continue to focus on all of our data and adjust our approach as needed until we can provide a vaccine to every Hoosier who wants one. We continue to see improvement in our positivity rate. Today, it stands at 4.7%, which is a significant drop from last week's rate of 6.2%. Just two weeks ago, our positivity rate was 7.7%. We also have seen another decline in the number of Hoosiers hospitalized with COVID symptoms. A total of 955 Hoosiers were hospitalized with symptoms of COVID as of yesterday, down from 1,300 last week. Our daily hospital admissions for COVID are just over 100, which is a vast improvement from the more than 500 new daily admissions that we saw in late November and early December. Our color-coded county maps look the best that they have looked in months. This week, we have no counties in red on our two-score map. Just over a month ago, 73 were in red. We, and we have 11 counties in blue, up from just one last week. Only eight counties are in orange, which means 73 are in yellow, up from 29 last week. Our advisory map, which indicates the level of restrictions that counties must follow, shows 42 counties in orange, down from 64 last week. Only one county is in red advisory level, down from four last week. That means more than half of our counties are in a yellow advisory level. Hoosiers, this is all positive news. We continue to move in the right direction, but please, please continue to wear your masks, stay socially distanced, and stay home when you're sick and get tested. We do continue to see Hoosiers lose their lives to this disease, but thankfully those numbers also have declined recently. Today we reported 20 new deaths, which brings our total lives lost to more than 12,000 when you include both confirmed and clinically diagnosed deaths. All along, we've told you that we want to be transparent in our data and in our data review. We are reporting to data as fast to you as fast and furious as we get it. But behind the scenes, we are in a constant review of that data. We can, 
we continue to review our death data to ensure that all deaths are accounted for and that those occurring among staff or residents of long-term care facilities are included on our long-term care dashboard. As a part of this process, we have identified another 660 deaths among residents and staff that are already included in our overall death totals, but had not been assigned yet to long-term care facilities. I want to be clear with you, these deaths are already part of our overall statewide dashboard. I want to walk you through this process. As the State Health Commissioner, I issued an order in April of 2020 that required all long-term facilities to report any COVID-19-related death or suspected COVID-19-associated death to the Indiana Department of Health. Our primary mechanism for identifying whether a death occurred in a long-term care facility is to have those facilities submit information directly to us when a death occurs. These deaths were not reported through this system, it appears. Facilities also are required to report COVID cases to us, and the facilities did report these cases. All of these positive cases were reported through the long-term care portal, but it wasn't until we reviewed cases and cross-referenced them with our death records that we determined that they had not been included in the long-term care dashboard. I want to emphasize again that these are not new deaths. All of these deaths have already been accounted for in statewide totals. We are just now, however, matching them with long-term care facilities so that they will be added to our long-term care dashboard tomorrow. The 660 deaths represent 273 different facilities with deaths occurring from April of 2020 to the end of January this year, with the highest numbers occurring in November and December. It appears most facilities missed reporting one or two deaths. 32 facilities appear to have missed reporting 6 to 10, and a handful of facilities appear to have missed reporting greater than 10 deaths. Keep in mind that CMS also issued a mandate for long-term care facilities to report deaths to them beginning May 17th. And in some cases, it appears that some of these facilities were reporting to CMS and maybe not to the state health department or vice versa. Maybe they were reporting to us and not to CMS. We will be reaching out to facilities that did not report through our system to determine if there were barriers to doing so, and we will continue to work to ensure that all long-term deaths, care deaths are reported in a timely manner. Our long-term care residents have borne the heaviest burden of this pandemic, and it's simply heartbreaking to see the percentage of our deaths that are attributable to these residents. COVID-19 preys on the vulnerable, and that is why we continue to focus on protecting those most at risk with this disease. And now Dr. Weaver will provide the latest updates for our vaccine distribution. Thank you, Dr. Box. We are very excited that more than 60% of our eligible populations have scheduled a vaccine or have already received at least their first dose. That is an incredible uptake and allows us to continue our mission of protecting Hoosiers who are most vulnerable to COVID-19. That total includes nearly 57% of Hoosiers 80 and older, nearly 65% of Hoosiers age 70 and older, and 56% of Hoosiers age 65 to 69. The number also includes about 68% of eligible healthcare workers and first responders. In addition, nearly 98,000 doses have been administered to residents and staff in long-term care. That includes both first and second doses. We continue to run a very narrow margin for doses received and doses administered, and our vaccine wastage has been minimal. Of the more than 1.3 million doses we have received so far, just 172 doses have been reported as wasted. Some of these are because of a vial or syringe broke, and since the manufacturers have determined that the vials contain more than the number of doses initially identified, the CDC also considers a dose wasted if the clinic doesn't get every single dose from a vial. Our wastage is about one one hundredth of a percent, and the credit goes to our vaccine clinics and all the hard work they are doing to make sure that every dose gets to someone who is eligible to receive it. As the governor mentioned, more than 43,000 vaccine appointments were impacted by the weather this week. More than 80 clinics around the state closed due to inclement weather. To further complicate matters this week, we have experienced delays in vaccine shipments due to the bad weather. We have not yet received our Moderna vaccines for this week. Therefore, unfortunately, more appointments will likely need to be rescheduled over the next couple of days. 
We have worked with those clinics to reschedule their patients as quickly as possible. This includes adding new appointments and adding extra days to the clinic schedules to ensure that there are no unnecessary delays in getting vaccines in arms. I want to remind Hoosiers that even though you are able to get a second dose at least 21 days for Pfizer and at least 28 days for Moderna, the CDC says that getting the second dose within 42 days still does provide full coverage. And if a person's second dose comes more than 42 days from the first one, the recommendation is to still go ahead and get that second dose and to not start the vaccine series over. Because of these issues, we will keep our current eligibility at Hoosiers age 65 and older. Once the vaccine deliveries get back on schedule, our plan is to open eligibility up to Hoosiers age 60 to 65. We will see how the weather continues to impact our shipments, but hopefully we will be able to expand as soon as sometime next week. This group includes approximately 432,000 people. By adding this age group to the list to those who are eligible, we will be able to prevent more than 64% of COVID hospitalizations and over 93% of the deaths here in Indiana. As I mentioned last week, we will continue to follow our age-based approach, which will take us down to age 50 and older, when vaccine supplies allow us to do so. In Indiana, this age group makes up just over 35% of the population, but accounts for 80% of COVID hospitalizations and nearly 98% of our deaths. Remember that there are nearly 858,000 Hoosiers in their 50s, so we will need a large influx of vaccine in order to lower eligibility to 50 and above. We also have begun reaching out to healthcare providers who have patients who are at increased risk of severe illness, such as those who are receiving dialysis, individuals with sickle cell disease, those who have received a solid organ transplant, individuals with Down syndrome, and people who are currently receiving treatment for cancer or have undergone treatment within the last three months. All these groups have increased risk of illness or death due to COVID, and we want to include them in our vaccine eligibility um, categories as soon as possible. While we work to expand vaccine eligibility, I want to remind Hoosiers that you will need to show proof that you live or work in Indiana and are eligible to receive the vaccine because you fit into one of the categories we have outlined. As of today, approximately 17,000 out-of-state residents have received a vaccine in Indiana. The majority of these individuals are from Kentucky and Illinois and are mostly healthcare workers or others who live in a neighboring state but work here in Indiana. We want to ensure that we are reserving our limited doses for the Hoosiers who need it the most. So we have reminded the vaccine clinics to verify eligibility before administering a vaccine. We also encourage Hoosiers to take a picture of your vaccine card so that you have it with you when you go to your second dose appointment. This helps ensure that you receive the same type of vaccine um, at your second appointment. Vaccine will continue to remain a precious resource for some time. We are confident that our approach will protect those who are most vulnerable and put Indiana in a strong position to emerge from this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weaver. And we're making a switcheroo here, and we'll go to Dr. Sullivan, and she can update us on the barriers that you and staff and partners out in the field are, are removing on a daily basis. Good afternoon. Over the past few weeks, doctors Box and Weaver have mentioned the various ways in which Indiana is helping Hoosiers get scheduled for their vaccinations, and I'd like to take a moment to give you an update on those efforts. If you've set up an appointment for someone or taken them to the vaccination site, our first thanks are to you. Keep it up. As we know, the state health department built a single scheduling system that would work statewide. They didn't ask hospitals to build their own or for each health department to take on this task alone. This is important and indicative of our in this together spirit. Thank you for that, Dr. Box. We also recognize that there are individuals who may have some barriers to immunizations, from simple things like not having access to a computer to register, to more complex situations like being homebound. So in addition to the centralized scheduling and registration system, we rapidly deployed the Indiana 211 call center for a brand new mission. A special team of 211 agents are trained in not only the technology system, but also in vaccine information and cultural competency techniques for answering questions from diverse groups. These teams are ready to listen and answer those questions so that individuals can make informed decisions for themselves. The call center helps individuals who may not have computer access, 
internet, or have difficulty otherwise registering on their own. And like we are experiencing this week, 211 can help reschedule appointments, over 5,500 so far, when snowstorms cancel vaccine clinics, giving Hoosiers the peace of mind that their shot still has their name on it. One of our team members shared this yesterday. They said, I had a caller that was 70 years old and needed to reschedule appointments for her, her husband, and her neighbor. She was so sweet and kind, she said they all needed their appointments to be at the same time and day so they could hold each other's hands and be a support system for one another. I was able to reschedule all of them on the same day and the same time. She was so happy. The 211 vaccine team began when Indiana's age-based eligibility went live. Since that time, they've answered 411,933 calls. They've scheduled 119,462 total appointments, which is more than 30% of the total non-healthcare worker appointments that have been scheduled. In January, they scheduled 69,928 appointments, and February 1st through 15th, another 49,534. In addition, we've been working with disability teams to address the needs of Hoosiers with developmental disabilities living in residential programs, our Division of Disability and Rehabilitative Services partnered with its provider network, the Department of Health, and Walgreens to develop a solution tailor-made for this vulnerable population. Launching next week, this team is poised to vaccinate approximately 5,000 individuals by the end of the month. Once this initial effort is complete, this team will begin plans to reach other Hoosiers with developmental disabilities who receive support through our home and community-based services program. Joining 211 to help form the statewide blanket vaccine engagement are our area agencies on aging. You may know them as the AAAs. Every corner of Indiana has an assigned AAA that helps older and or in disabled Hoosiers and their caregivers navigate life's challenges to find the help they need. In the vaccine effort, the AAAs were asked to call every eligible Hoosier who had received services from them and help them sign up for a vaccine. So far, they have registered nearly 7,000 Hoosiers for vaccine and have helped troubleshoot transportation and other human services needs. Our AAA partners have shared a few stories with us. One said, when I was making multiple calls, uh, multiple people told me they appreciated it as they wouldn't have registered at all on their own. Also, in one case, I was able to register both the client and their home health aide at the same time. Another quote from a card sent by two 70-year-old clients where the AAA had some trouble getting them into a site they could easily drive to and get back to appointments, so they only had to go once. They said, we can't even begin to express all of our appreciation to you for all of the help, time, and knowledge you put into getting us our vaccine appointments. Everything went smoothly, and neither of us experienced any side effects from the shot. This one is my favorite. This was a call to a 182-year-old who responded to the call, oh honey, I've already registered myself and two of my friends, but I'm glad to see you are reaching out. Addition, additionally to the AAAs, there are volunteers with the AARP also working the phones to encourage older Hoosiers to register for their appointments. So far, these volunteers have made 3,000 calls over four weeks. Their anecdotes should be published in Indiana's COVID memoirs. In addition to offering vaccine encouragement, these volunteers are connecting with our senior citizens, offering companionship, a listening ear, and resources if they need help. Here's one of my favorite stories. A woman in Greater Indy thanked us for what the AARP is doing and said our call inspired her to begin calling her people. She wanted to share with them her experience with me, walking her through, scheduling her appointment online, and how simple it was. She mentioned that many of her friends were uneasy about online registration, and she was excited to share how to do it. Additionally, our Medicaid Managed Care Health Plans have team members who are reaching out to eligible members for support in scheduling and registration, making over 3,000 calls in their very first week. For those with transportation benefits, as part of our Medicaid coverage, our managed care partners can schedule transportation for the clinic visit as well. One of the most unique partnerships that materialized is with community libraries around the state. For generations, libraries have been places where you can find some of the least appreciated most knowledgeable and most helpful professionals in your community, librarians. Special thanks to the Executive Director of the Indiana Library Federation, Lucinda Nord, for arranging a training for librarians so now libraries statewide are also places where you can get help registering for your COVID-19 vaccination and find a computer and internet access. More than 1,300 library employees across the state have been trained to help their fellow Hoosiers. Thank you so much. 
Another contribution to the statewide vaccine effort is the Hoosier Homebound Portal. This centralized data hub is beginning to help connect homebound Hoosiers to their local health departments and emergency medical personnel for home COVID-19 vaccination. This again involves the AAAs, who take requests from Hoosiers and work with local health departments and with the new portal to make sure everyone who requests the vaccine is accounted for. If you or anyone you know who is eligible for vaccination needs this service, you can connect with the Area Agency on Aging for that person's location. Dr. Kaufman from EMS from the Department of Homeland Security will share more on this program in the coming weeks. Finally, we know local and state community organizations are doing incredible work to promote evidence-based vaccine information. Local United Ways, the Indiana Red Cross, and many more are stepping up to make sure that no one is uninformed or left behind. Nothing having to do with this pandemic fits into a nice, neat box. Individual stories, nimble innovation, and a shared humanity binds us together. This is true of our vaccine effort as well. This has, and will continue to, take creativity, ingenuity, sacrifice, and teamwork. I continue to be overwhelmed by the diligence of our partners at the Department of Health in coordinating such a massive undertaking. It is a privilege to support this effort and to get a glimpse into the way Hoosiers Helping Hoosiers continue to define our COVID response. It's our shot. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. You, um, <clears throat> you, rem you remind me that I think we all dream in numbers and acronyms around here, but uh, what you just shared is also a reminder that behind every number or acronym is a person, and it's a real living example uh, and circumstance that we focus on every day. And but wait, there's more. Um, every every day we try to refine and we try to improve on the system. We try to make sure it's easy as possible to get information about the whole vaccination process. Um, to once you're eligible, to get access um, to that process, and that it is as smooth and easy as any government service ever conceived. Um, and I'm, again, I'll pile on the praise and, and uh, pride of how we've come together as a team. We've put together, to Dr. Sullivan's point, we put together a video to further illustrate this uh, about some experiences out in the field. And Rachel, if you could cue it up, we'll go with that, and then we'll go to uh, Jacob's site. Here's what Hoosiers are saying about the COVID-19 vaccination process. I was sent an email through Indiana State Department of Health. Basically, I followed the link and it was a simple process. Indiana has set up a great website. It's ourshot.in.gov. You can get all the information about the vaccine, how to register, and who's eligible right there. Well, we were asked by the state to be a part of this. We were very excited about it. And so far in the last what, maybe a couple of weeks, really, we've registered over a thousand people. Well, here in Fort Wayne, it was just great. I it was signed up easily, got in, service was great, got my vaccination and was all set and got my next one scheduled. And it was really pretty seamless. I would say we were in and out uh, of uh, the whole place within a uh, half hour. The process has been extremely simple. One client told me it could not have been organized any better. The process was very well planned. There was no, no really waiting time and the staff was very efficient. It's a blessing to be able to uh, have the opportunity to take the, the vaccine and look forward to taking the next one and hoping all for the best. The first one, I didn't even feel it. I, I did not feel that shot at all. There was no side effect, no chill, no headache, uh, nothing. No side effects at all. And I was so happy that it was early and went and had breakfast. <laughs> the people who were administering the vaccines were thanking me. Uh, I was thanking them for their time and service, and, and they were thanking me for, for actually taking the shot. 
as a registered nurse, I've done my research on this topic and my advice would be to go ahead and get it. It was important for me to get the vaccine. I want to do my part to make sure that I'm keeping the community safe and doing everything that I can to prevent the spread of COVID-19. I believe that this vaccine is really bringing a spark to our community. I think everybody is now looking at this as the beginning of the end. And so I encourage people to take this vaccination because we can get back to our way of life. It's easy, it's free, and it's helpful. Why not do it? When you become eligible, you can begin your vaccination process at ourshot.in.gov. You can also receive registration assistance through your local library, AARP, and Area Agencies on Aging. It's Our Shot, Hoosiers. Hi, my name's Jacob Seip. I'm the Executive Director at the Indiana Housing and Community Development Authority. Indiana has received approximately $448 million in emergency rental assistance and utility home energy assistance funding through the new COVID-19 relief bill. This is different from previous COVID-19 rental assistance programs offered in Indiana. Last year, as you know, Governor, you uh, allocated $25 million in coronavirus relief funds to IHCDA to create the COVID-19 Rental Assistance Program. To address the ongoing need for rental assistance, you allocated additional funding for this program that ended with a total of $49,042,027 that provided assistance to over 25,181 Hoosiers. This program is now closed as we prepare to launch this new emergency rental assistance and utility home energy assistance program. Since this is a new program, any renter household in Indiana that needs assistance and not currently receiving it from another source should consider applying for this program once it is available. In addition to the state of Indiana, six Indiana municipalities have received emergency rental assistance funding and will administer their own program. We are working very closely with these six municipalities to ensure renters in need of assistance in their service areas know how and where to apply where these applications, when these applications become available. And I wanna thank those local municipalities for their hard work in preparing to launch their programs. The state of Indiana, through the Indiana Housing Community Development Authority, will cover all areas of the state that do not have a local municipality receiving the emergency rental assistance funds. And those communities are Elkhart County, Hamilton County, Lake County, Marion County, the city of Indianapolis, the city of Fort Wayne, St. Joseph County, and the state of Indiana through IHCDA. The Emergency Rental Assistance Program is designed to assist households that are unable to pay rent and utilities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The eligible households can receive up to 12 months of rental assistance and utility home energy assistance. This includes a combination of past due rent and future month's rent. An eligible household under the Emergency Rental Assistance Program is defined by the U.S. Department of Treasury as a renter household in which at least one or more individuals meets the following criteria. Qualifies for unemployment or has experienced a reduction in household income, incurred significant cost, or experienced a financial, financial hardship due to COVID-19. They must demonstrate a risk of experiencing homelessness or housing instability. A household income at or below 80% of our state's area median income. And there are two examples I can provide you on the 80% AMI. A two-person household would be at or below 46,250, and a four-person household with an annual income at or below 57,850. So where are we with our program? IHCDA released a draft program policy for the Indiana Emergency Rental Assistance Program on February 8th and accepted public comments. We are currently awaiting revised guidance from the U.S. Department of Treasury, which should be available shortly. Launching without this guidance could result in opening and then having to close our rental assistance portal to retool the application to comply with the new guidance. Once we receive the revised guidance from the U.S. Department of Treasury, we will be in a position to begin accepting applications. We expect to launch this program with one, one week of receiving this guidance. Renter households in need of assistance are encouraged to subscribe and receive updates on COVID-19 housing and utility resources at indianahousingnow.org. 
An email notification will be sent to those subscribers informing them when the application for the Emergency Rental Assistance Program is available. Renter households in Elkhart County, Hamilton County, Lake County, Marion County, the City of Indianapolis, the City of Fort Wayne, and St. Joseph County must apply through their local program and are not eligible to apply for the rental assistance and utility home energy assistance through the state's program. Once available, the complete list of contact information for each of these local emergency rental assistance programs will also be posted at indianahousingnow.org. Currently, we have contact information for Hamilton County, Marion County, City of Indianapolis, St. Joseph County, and the state of Indiana, which would be IHCDA, and that would be at indianahousingnow.org. And we've also partnered with Indiana 211. If you are a homeowner at risk of foreclosure, Assistance remains available at 877-GET-HOPE.ORG. So thank you, Governor, for giving me an opportunity to provide that update. Don't, don't uh, veer off or stray far. Uh, also, Dr. Dan is on deck if um, we've got any questions for, for Dr. Dan as well. With that, Rachel, why don't we just get at it? Sherry with the Indianapolis Star. Afternoon, Sherry. Afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Um, everyone else is there. I have a, a quick question I wanted for, to ask Dr. Weaver and then one for either Dr. Weaver or Dr. Box. My question for Dr. Weaver, does the 172 doses include yesterday with all the clinics being uh, canceled? And then Dr. Box, I'm wondering if you could talk about how much is being done, um, you know, what percentage of tests are looking for those variant strains? Uh, if there is a particular area of the state, I think we've now seen 13 of the uh, B117 strain, if it if it's concentrated in a particular area of the state, or if it's all over, and even if you know when people if they test positive, are they told that they have this specific strain, or is it something that that they would never know? Thank you. So I can start, and then Lindsay will um, flip to you. So we we do discuss the particular strain with them because we want to delve a little bit further into the contacts that they've had. We want to make sure if they've done any travel or any, you know, uh, been in contact with anyone else that we know to be um, positive for this particular strain. So it is something we let them know, and and then of course work on quarantining and making sure they understand the importance of that. We are gearing up right now and having conversations this week with additional labs here in the state of Indiana that will also be doing this genomic sequencing here in addition to our own public health lab. Um, we are sending a certain number, it's I think between 20 and 40 um, a week to the CDC, but I can get Sherry that information specifically for you and get that to you after this because I know Pam Pontonis, my st state epidemiologist, will be up on exactly how much we're sending out. Lindsay? Yes, thank you. Good question about the wasted doses. So the 172 was the most up-to-date information I received. I am not aware of any additional doses that were wasted yesterday because of the canceled clinics. Um, most of the clinics, they were aware they were going to need to cancel the night before, and so we actually started calling people and rescheduling at that time. So in those cases, the vials would not have been removed from the freezer, so they wouldn't be unthawed um, or taken out of the refrigerator. So hopefully there were no wasted doses yesterday. Yesterday. Nikki Kelly with the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could break down the 660 number you gave. You said that was residents and staff, and I was wanting to know how many are, how many of each. Mm -hmm. So that was 659 uh, residents and one staff individual. Lindsay or Doty with the Indianapolis Business Journal. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, the veto override is on the House calendar this afternoon. In addition to that, you know, we've seen bills on executive power kind of trying to rein that in a little bit. We've seen your budget be changed by House Republicans. We've saw pregnancy accommodations isn't happening this year. So why do you think you're losing so many of these battles in the State House this year? And what are you doing to change that? Lindsay, we're still in the second quarter. Um, I don't think I've gone a session getting 100% of, of what I wanted at the outset. I would, if you were scoring our legislative agenda that we put out, we're probably batting 900. Um, having said that, we're in a year unlike no one 
has ever faced before. We've gone through some unprecedented challenging times. Thankfully, the state of Indiana is in much better shape than a lot of our counterparts in competition. Uh, so I'm, I'm pleased about where we are. I'll continue to work with members um, upstairs. I think they have the best of intentions, including on the uh, relationship between the legislature and the executive office. We have to execute on a daily, minute-by-minute -minute basis. And so, as I've mentioned before, in terms of um, uh, bills regarding executive powers, the bare minimum is that lawmakers pass laws that are constitutional. And I seek to work with them um, from that position and include them in conversations and how we make decisions. We've been doing this over the last year, by the way. And so um, I understand that we've got more than two quarters left in this long session. We are um, in a position, Lindsay, to pass our ninth straight balanced budget. We are in a position to pay off debt. We are in a position to increase K through 12 funding, to increase higher education, to increase workforce development programs. We are in a position to complete mega transformational infrastructure projects. We are in a position to adapt to this new normal in terms of our state health department and local health departments. We are, are investing um, revenue because we've done a pretty darn good job, all things considered, of balancing lives and livelihoods. And we'll continue to modernize our state services so that citizens themselves can better access uh, those services when and where they see fit. And so to hone in on before the second court, before we even go into halftime to the locker room uh, and start counting defeats would be premature at the least. Rob Burgess with the Wabash Plain Dealer. Afternoon, Rob. Afternoon, Governor. How are you today? Fantastic. <laughs> All things considered. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a, yeah, um, I'm, I'm proud to be a Hoosier. Absolutely, for sure. Um, I had one for the doctors and then one for you. Uh, what is your opinion on double masking? And Governor, on Monday, our County Board of Commissioners unanimously passed a resolution opposing House Bill 1381, which establishes default standards for wind power in the state, saying it reduces local control. Uh, I wanted to see if I could get your reaction to the bill as it's currently written. Sure. You want to go with double masking sure. and then I'll get to the the wind? Sure. So CDC has some good recommendations about masks and masking and how to wear them, that they should be two or three layers thick, and that for especially individuals that are particularly at higher risk, wearing the double mask where you have a mask that fits very closely around your face and then an additional mask on the outside is certainly a, a good option. We know that it doesn't um, completely eliminate the... the um, transmittal of respiratory uh, droplets. So that's why it's important that both individuals in that proximity of each other have their masks on. So certainly we would support that. I know that a lot of people are uncomfortable with that additional mask, but when you are living with someone who is at risk or you yourself are particularly at risk, um, it's still a very good idea. Yeah, and uh, Rob, um, you know, where I come at this, um, is obviously we want to make sure that we have a um, statewide, attractive, all the above approach to our energy sources, um, balancing that with um, local decision making. And so what that final language is in that particular bill that you're referring to, 1381, I think you've mentioned, um, will be very important to see what the criteria is, what um, what language restricts or allows locals to continue to make the decisions that are in the best interest for their locality. Um, also, again, balancing that we're a state um, that thankfully, you could say this about our tax code too, by the way, um, thankfully our energy policy as we move forward has been all the above, it has been diversified. And so we wanna make sure that uh, that local farmer who's trying to maximize their acreage um, and, and, and also um, keep in mind their neighbors, 
um, has the ability to do that, um, while at the same time making sure that we're a great state for um, continuing to not just make and ship, but create products that uh, are moved all over the world. So, you know, again, I would, I don't want to answer prematurely into what that specific language will look like um, in the second half because it could it could change as well. But but right now, obviously, I, t I look through this um, lens locally balanced from a statewide approach. Abdul Hakim Shabazz, Indy Politics. Afternoon, Abdul. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, Dr. Box. Uh, two questions real quickly. Dr. Box, my question for you, is any of those uh, 56,000 have been fully vaccinated? Uh, has anyone experienced any sort of adverse uh, reaction, not, not necessarily a sore arm, 50. but maybe more serious uh, reaction to that second dosage? And, Governor, my question for you is on uh, the legislature curbing your authority, almost a follow-up to Lindsay's question. Uh, do you prefer the House version or the Senate version or, or somewhere in between uh, with curbing your executive authority? So I'll go ahead and start. Uh, we get, as you probably are aware, uh, reports from the CDC, from VAERS, which is the Vaccine Adverse Effects Reporting System. We actually even have a way for individuals to text back and forth with the CDC and report their adverse reactions. We have had individuals that have had major anaphylaxis. I believe um, it, we're still at two cases here in the state of Indiana. We have had individuals that have received the vaccine and at some time in the future passed away. But when we look at deaths here in the state of Indiana, in these particular age groups, we see absolutely no increase or excess deaths that could be accountable to the vaccine itself. And that is what the ACIP has reported on with regards to national data also. Yeah, Abdul, I would say I would prefer more conversation about uh, both. And, and we'll have that. And um, the, the, the channels of communication are open. Um, again, I, I, don't, uh, I don't have a law degree, Abdul, you do. Um, so you might be able to read the language thus far, but I, I remain unconvinced um, that the paths that we're going down right now are constitutional. There are ways to get at the intent of both of those bills, and that goes through the people if you want to change the Constitution. Now, if you think it's constitutional, if you disagree with me, I'm not trying to be a blockhead about this, um, then so be it, and we'll have to, someone else will ultimately decide uh, whether or not it's constitutional or unconstitutional. But again, we've got a lot of time left. Uh, I, I hate to give you a preference um, with my understanding as it is written today uh, on whether or not either of those are constitutional. Kathy with the Ferdinand News. Afternoon, Kathy. Good afternoon. Glad to see, see you both today and hear you both today. I'm going to give some praise first to Indiana. Uh, my brother lives in California, and he and his wife in their 80s know of no one and have not been able to get a shot and have, have find no one who has gotten one. Aye. So I think we're doing a lot better than some other states. My question is kind of referenced, and it's for you, Dr. Box or Dr. Weaver, going back to a question I asked last week, and that was about the antibody therapy. And um, immediately I got an email from a local hospital saying, oh, yes, we're using it and all this. And then I got a call from a nurse from Fort Wayne, who very far away up north, who said, the, the antibody therapy and the convalescent plasma, if you've had either, either of those treatments, you should not get your, your vaccine for 90 days. And she was concerned that that information wasn't getting out and possibly uh, also what the repercussions would be if you would get a shot within that 90 day or vaccine uh, with having in either of those two therapies. That, that is very correct information, and that's because the, what we call the half-life of those antibodies in your system can be up to 90 days. It's not that you necessarily would have a particularly adverse reaction. It's just that your immunization, your vaccine might not be as effective for you because those antibodies still in your system would prevent your body from having the normal immune reaction that we want it to have from receiving the vaccine. I do know that individuals that receive this are told that they 
should not receive the vaccine for 90 days, secondary to how it might affect the efficacy of the vaccine. Individuals that have already received their first dose then get ill and get monoclonal antibodies um, or convalescent plasma actually um, can wait that 90 days and then get their second dose. So thanks for pointing that out, Kathy. Adam Wren, Indianapolis Monthly. Afternoon, Adam. <coughs> Afternoon, Governor. Uh, the Attorney General, uh, Todd Rukita, has said that he's keeping his private sector job uh, at a health benefits company. Do you think that's a good uh, approach to, to governance and a good return on the investment that taxpayers uh, in Indiana make on his salary each year? Adam, honestly, I haven't spent much time at all um, on this issue, did did hear about it recently, um, but I, I trust uh, the attorney general has followed the letter of the law and is uh, in, a, in a spot that is um, legal and and protected. And I'll leave it to him to make the calls about um, where he works in addition to his full time job here. Whitney Downard with CNHI. Good afternoon, Whitney. Good afternoon. I've got a question for Dr. Dan, and then I've got a question for you, Governor. Okay. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Dan's already rushing to the uh, microphone. <laughs> I emailed you know, the health department specifically about when visitation would reopen at nursing homes, and they repeated what you said earlier about CMS waiting to or waiting on guidance for CM, from CMS, but they haven't updated their visitation guidance since, since September. You know, families would really like to get beyond just the essential caregiver and be able to be reunited. So could you kind of tell me what markers, what measurements are we waiting for in order to reopen that? And, you know, with all this vaccine progress, how does that play into it? Great question, Whitney. Um, so one thing I quickly kind of remind folks is that Indiana put out its visitation guidelines and updated them in July, and those are still in effect. So in a lot of counties right now in the state of Indiana, a visitation is allowed. So if a county has less than 10% positivity, and we use the CDC tracker, so less than seven, uh, the seven day uh, positivity is less than 10%. And the facility has ha not had a new facility uh, based uh, case or outbreak in the last 14 days, visitation is allowed. And so what is not changed and what we haven't gotten guidance from CMS on is the social distancing measures that are in place. So families that would be coming in would still be required to wear a mask, still be required to socially distance, uh, be in, uh, you know, a, a you know, be able to visit with their loved one, but do so in, in those uh, protected kind of infection control practices. So that's not changed. And so counties that are higher than 10%, according to CMS, would still uh, not have indoor visitation. They could do outdoor, but obviously with the weather, that's a lot more difficult. I think one of the big things that we're waiting on uh, is that social distancing part and whether or not vaccinations will change that. So uh, certainly we hear lots of uh, comments from families who would really love to be able to hug their loved ones, and hold their hands. But according to the CMS guidance right now, they're still going to follow those social distancing practices. Uh, in terms of what we're doing, uh, I can tell you uh, from the folks uh, in our long-term care division and from every state that's on a call with CMS, this comes up on every single call every single week because every state is really looking for uh, kind of loosening some of that uh, guidance so that we can get more families uh, in contact with more of their loved ones in facilities as fast as possible. As soon as we know that we can loosen that, uh, we will come out with recommendations and guidelines uh, probably that day, if not uh, sooner. And you had one for me, Whitney. Jumping off of Abdul and Lindsay here. Um, one of the big differences between your proposed budget and the House Republican proposed budget was the 66 million for voucher expansion. You know, what is your thoughts on expanding those vouchers? You know, we are still in a pandemic and public schools kind of getting shorted here. Could you kind of talk about that? Yeah, I would say even bigger than that. I mean, I'm going to Bigger than that, I offered in my budget to pay down $400 million in the pre-96 uh, fund. I offered to pay off some of I-69 um, debt that we had. So, you know, there's there's places, yes, that we do disagree on the budget, but um, 
There's places where, quite frankly, um, the House's budget invested more than I was recommending, and, and I can see the validity in where they're moving toward in terms of um, a regional accelerator initiative into um, quality of place and quality of life measures in terms of broadband internet. And so, again, um, we don't we don't arrive at the final destination. Destination. Nothing is nothing is dead until signee die, and and um, and language will change up until signee die. Um, having said that about vouchers specifically, because you asked, um, obviously. Um, Parents during this time, as you mentioned, um, are daily reevaluating where the best um, environment is for their child to be instructed and to learn. And so I've always been for that. Having said that, we continue uh, both budgets. Mine included a $377 million increase to public K through 12 education. And so we can do a couple things at the same time um, and and uh, meet parents where their demand is. Dan Klein with Wish TV. Afternoon, Dan. Good afternoon, Governor. Thanks for taking my questions. I've got two. Um, one, I know this is something we kind of addressed two weeks ago, but today Vice President um, Kamala Harris said teachers should be a priority for getting the vaccine. What do you think about that? Is that something you will... Uh, reconsider um, when it comes to the kind of priority. And then the second one I had last week, uh, Dr. Virginia Kane estimated under current conditions, herd immunity uh, might be possible um, in early October if the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you know, was approved and there was 100 million doses. She estimated that at least in Marion County, herd immunity could happen by June 30th. Do you have any estimates for that or what are your thoughts about when herd immunity could be possible for the state of Indiana. You know, that's really going to depend on when we receive enough vaccine to do that, right? I mean, we are ready and prepared with sites and individuals all over the state to get vaccine in arms. Um, and it's a question on, of when we get the vaccine and that goalpost seems to continuously move. So I don't know if Dr. Weaver has anything she wants to add to that thought process, yeah. but we are ready and willing and able as soon as we get vaccine. Yeah, and I would say uh, same same true, Dan, for teachers. I mean, when you listen to what the administration has put out, I, I don't think there's a lot of daylight actually between um, guidance that they and the CDC has put out in terms of how we and can we and when can we um, um, have in-class instruction. I think we're pretty much aligned they most recently and maybe you could come back to that but I would I would say this we too want teachers to be vaccinated as soon as we get the doses right now we're trying to um, no we're not trying we are um, going at this from who is dying and then those comorbidities that also play a factor and so when we get through you know, the priority of saving lives and those people who are hospitalized. By the way, the administration has said the same thing. And, of course, we all want that person that's working in the grocery store or working in the truck stop and has traffic 24 hours a day coming through and our teachers because of the uh, schools and kids and having to be in quarantine. We get this. We we're, we're, that's why we're asking for more and more, and we're asking for sometimes the impossible because um, the pharmaceutical companies that are, have been authorized are, are churning this and kicking this out just as fast as they can as well. And we appreciate the extra doses um, that are coming our way. Um, but it's not, it's not a we're picking one over the other. We're picking people who we're trying to save lives and keep people from being hospitalized. And we're looking at the science to determine this. And if you listen very carefully to the administration, they are saying the same thing. Um, now, you want to talk about the three feet. And because CDC has come out with some updates that actually align with what you said weeks ago. 
they're very, very close. Yeah. I, I really like that Dr. Walensky, the new CDC director and the Department of Education director, put out a, a media advisory um, in, I think it was the 12th, uh, 12th of February. And in that, they walked through those kind of five critical priorities that really need to be there. And that was just as you would expect. It is basically having physical distancing to the best of your ability, universal correct use of masking, making sure that hand washing and respiratory etiquette is right and cleaning um, in uh, certain surfaces and contact tracing. And they, they mentioned very specifically that especially if you're following those, those three important ones, that masking, making sure that you are cleansing and doing good respiratory etiquette and doing the contact tracing, that you really could decrease that distance from six foot to three foot, which is where we had right. gone as a state because our data and the national data shows that that has been very safe. And really the critical part of that is that everybody is masked at all times. When you are within six feet, or if you're singing or yelling or doing other things, you need to be beyond six feet. But when you are within six feet, you have to be masked for sure. If you're eating at lunch, you need to be separated by further a further distance than that three foot. So I was really, really pleased to see that many of the themes that we had been talking about, uh, uh, Dr. Walensky said very specifically that um, Schools could open very safely without teachers being vaccinated, but that when vaccine allows, yeah. we should vaccinate our teachers, which is our desire also. Yeah, we get the whole quarantine and we get the, and then a parent has to stay home and, or you need childcare. And so we get the ripple effect. We're just, we need more doses. We'll get them in arms and we'll get everybody back. We're at, you know, 4.3 unemployment, but I was reminded by the governor yesterday of Vermont, he's at three. So uh, we're, we're all in this race. Thank you for joining today's briefing. Governor Holcomb's next briefing will be next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern.